I just want to thank Kyle and Robin for all the hard work they've done to set this up and for inviting Chris and I to come and speak today. You know, it's a real pleasure to talk about um, our research and the things that connect our respective research. Um, so what we're going to speak about today has been influenced quite greatly by readings of anti-racist and feminist literatures, and it reflects Chris and I's commitment to promote the vo voices of Black decolonial and Indigenous scholars. Um, for me, this was relevant when I was doing my walking project um, in 2015, particularly because my dad was included as the research assistant and both my parents and our family friends were participants. Um, and for Chris, his recently awarded PhD was about the insignificance of football spaces in the lives of men categorized as refugees and asylum seekers. Okay, sorry, I'm just fiddling because I just wanna get a better view of what I'm looking at. Okay, so to frame the purpose of our talk, I wanted to refer to this image on the opening slide. This photo included in the 2021 Welcome Trust photograph of the year made me think about the lives of ordinary people like that of Hannah Limirez, the woman pictured here. When I first looked at her, I began to ponder where Hannah might be going with her big suitcase, for how long and whether she lived in the area or was passing through Ridley Road in London. We are told by the blurb accompanying the photo that Hannah was an IT project manager. She was made redundant last year for reasons connected to the COVID-19 pandemic. She says that being made redundant made her feel ashamed, like a failure. This comment resonated with me. I wanted to know more about Hannah's life story. The blurb quotes Hannah as saying, now I'm grateful for where I'm at and excited because it taught me to be resilient and to have the courage to grow into the unknown. I found both the photograph and Hannah's self-representation evocative and as an invitation to think about how par approaches may enable us to tell different life stories in this talk, partly inspired by Hannah, we wanted to propose the idea of sitting in discomfort and also taking a journey into the unknown as both productive sites of knowledge generation. Can you flick to the next one, Chris? So to speak to this purpose, we will first critique white male Eurocentric projects, which predominantly shape how we know what we know and what implications this has for studying the social world. So just so you're clear, from now on, I'm going to talk about this as the Western social sciences canon. Second, embracing different ways of knowing as espoused by bottom-up, decolonial, indigenous and feminist approaches. Chris, in this part of the talk, will specifically focus upon the practicalities, problems and possibilities of doing par and how it may or may not cohere with traditional methods of analysis and representation. As Chris will elucidate, this created discomfort, a journey into the unknown for both him and his PhD supervisors, of which I was one. We will then reconsider the challenges of analyzing and representing PAR materials to wrap up our talk and invite audience questions and comments. Next one, please, Chris. Right, so why have I got Plato's face on this slide? So about 10 years ago, I taught social philosophy to about 180 sport and exercise science first year students. And, you know, I guess for many scholars of leisure who are, you know, teaching these kind of students, you might be thinking, oh my God, it's my worst possible nightmare. But I have to say, I absolutely loved it because I loved engaging with the students, but also it was a really important learning journey for me too, because what I learned kind of stuck in my head. So quite often when I was um, teaching these students and many of them were white male, middle-class students, 
they tended to view the lives of different groups of people as natural facts. For example, men are better than women at sport and black people are naturally faster than white people. And you know, sometimes these facts seem like they had a life of their own, a discursive power that the students just found it really difficult to look past or get underneath. Even when I presented evidence to dismiss the science that underpinned their assumptions. Questioning instead my logic and reason using whatever materials they could pass off as proof to kind of demonstrate my ignorance. So we had some great debates and obviously I had to push back on um, their dismissal of everything I said. And, you know, that made me kind of make them think about how the images that they thought they knew as fact were in fact constructed images. So to do this, you know, I borrowed um, quite a lot of the language in terms of key European social philosophers, including that of Plato. Now I am gonna play a thing about Plato's work and I'm gonna warn you, it's really a bit sweary, but I think those of you who know me know that I find this stuff hilarious <laughs> and that ignore the swearing, just focus on um, the delivery of the message. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Let me put it this way. Imagine you're in a cave, all chained up so you can't turn your body at all, and all you get to look at is this one wall. Some assholes behind you are making shadow puppets using the light from a fire and making echo noises, and that's all you or anyone else chained up has seen or heard all your life. Sounds terrible, right? Except that's all you've ever known, shadows and echoes, and that's your whole world. There's no way you can know that, really. You're watching a slightly improved M. Night Shyamalan film. In fact, you get pretty good at understanding how the patterns in the show work, and everyone else chained up is like... Holy shit, bro! How did you know that tree was going to fall on that guy? And you're like... It's because I fucking pay attention, and I'm smart as shit. You're the smartest of the chain, and they all revere you. But Socrates, a tree didn't really hit the guy. It's all shadows. No shit, Raukarn. But you didn't know that. You think the shadows are real things. Everyone does. Now shut up and let me finish. So eventually, someone comes and unchains you and drags you out of the cave. At first you'd say, Seriously? What the fuck is going on? Well, actually, at first you'd say, Holy shit, my eyes! And you'd want to go back to the safe, familiar shadows. But even once your eyes worked, you wouldn't believe them, because everything you ever thought was real is gone. You'd look at a tree and say, That is not a tree. I know trees. And you, sir, are no tree. That down there is a tree. But you're wrong. Down there is a shadow of a tree. Slowly, as your eyes got better, you'd see more and more shit. Eventually, you'd see the sun and realize that it's the source of all light. You can't see shit without the sun. Oh shit, that is a tree. Not me. So, nothing in the cave was real? I feel like such an asshole. But it's not your fault, so don't be so hard on yourself. Finally, you want to go down and tell everyone about everything you've discovered. Except, and here's the hilarious part, they think you've gone fucking crazy. You'd say, Guys, real trees are green. And they'd say, What the fuck is green? That is a tree over there. And you'd squint and look at the wall, but you know you're fucked because now you're used to having sunlight and now you can't see shit. So they'd laugh at you and agree that wherever it was that you went, no one should go there because it turns people into dickheads. Philosophy, same thing. The soul ascends and apprehends the forms, the nature of everything, and eventually the very idea of good that gives light to everything else. And then the philosopher has to go back to the cave and try to explain it to people who don't even know what green is to say nothing of the good. But the philosopher didn't make up the good. It was always there. And the only way to really make sense of it is to uncover it for yourself. You can't force knowledge into a gut any more than you can force sight into a blind man. So if you want to learn, be totally 
prepared for a difficult journey. And be prepared to make some mistakes. That's okay. It's all part of the process. True knowledge must be obtained the hard way. And some people just don't want to see the hard You know, if, if people don't mind, um, and you're not like wearing your pajamas or something, can I see a few faces? Because I, I'm looking at just static photos and I find it a bit, yeah, cheers. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Oh, hi, everybody. Oh, it's so nice to see everyone's faces. All right. So for many postgraduate students and social science scholars, the institutions we inhabit in the West to be precise, the practices and ethics which predominate how we do research, the literatures we read, the discussions we have with those in and across our cognate disciplines, reinforces the utility of the tools we use to garner evidence to understand the social realities of the world we live in. So Chris and I are not disputing the value of these well-known social science theories, methodologies and methods, but what we are critiquing is how evidence is only viewed as legitimate in the terms and conditions espoused through Western social sciences. So if we treat the cave as a metaphor for Western social sciences, to step outside of the cave for many of us evokes discomfort to use systems of meaning which do not make sense to us as scholars who have been inculcated in the ways of the cave. Like for many of my sport and exercise science students, to get beyond or beneath taken for granted scientific rationalities was challenging, but we're saying it's not impossible. Uh, I've just got to scroll down one sec, sorry. So what we propose as a method to overcome this challenge is the productive possibilities of having dialogues across our different social science traditions and perspectives. If you like, horizontally viewing the multiple ways people make sense of the world as legitimate, rather than hierarchically position the Western model of social sciences as the best and only way of knowing the social world. So next one, Chris, as Gabindra Bamra informs us, oh, yeah, uh, sociology as an area of study indeed emerged through transnational dialogues, cultural and ideological exchanges, and the fusion of different philosophical discussions about the nature of being and living the so-called good life. A fusion of ideals which across time and space was subsequently raised through the repositioning and reconstruction of European social history as solely induced through the intellectual curiosity of European male philosophers, such as Plato. So one outcome of this retelling of European history was to construct the intellectual superiority of white European males as purveyors of modernity. So rational thinking, civilized and worldly subjects in relation to those from the East or elsewhere who were comparatively rendered inferior, so pre-modern, ruled by nature, local customs and mysticism, rather than by science or reason. Thus, doing par from an indigenous, decolonial and feminist perspective, we can feel like we're in an existential crisis, having to affect transformative action for those we are researching with and for, whilst also needing to democratize the Western social science project to give meaning to what we are doing. Knowing all along that our PhD ableness, scholarly practice and publications will nevertheless be viewed as legitimate or a pile of <laughs> based on measures embedded within this institutionalized and predominant Western social science framework. So, Chris, you can go to the next one, I think. In the current neoliberal context of being and becoming an academic, this often means complicity to the status quo rather than confronting the people, structures, and taking for granted cultural norms and values that continue to hold up the walls of the cave, so to speak. So even as we try to create openings and to step outside of the cave, 
you know, to engage with new ways of knowing, we doubt ourselves. Even in my own work, by using terms such as counter-hegemonic to position my research with and on members of my family and friends, I too felt obligated to be seen to be passing various ethical and publication thresholds. So standards which were measured against the Western social sciences template. So when I was talking to Chris last week, I realized that by using that term counter-hegemonic, what I was actually doing was reinforcing and reproducing the Western social science canon as actually hegemonic and how other ways of knowing can only be made knowable in relation to this, um, uh, you know, uh, in relation to this Western social science model. So whilst I don't necessarily see that by using that word, you know, it was a great faux pas, it was a learning experience because, you know, when I was sitting in that tension between Western social science education experience on one hand, having grown up and studied um, social sciences in the Western Academy, you know, my reading on the other hand was greatly influenced by indigenous decolonial and feminist readings. And I really wanted to kind of take some of those ideas and put them into my work. But then, you know, being in that middle, it's a really difficult place. And therefore, by using terms such as de uh, counter hegemonic, all I really achieved was trying to justify what I'd done in relation to what was seen as the ideal position. And actually, I, I you know, I want to find now the language and the words that's going to help me and I guess others to kind of move past this sort of entrenched notion of Western social sciences as the only way of knowing. So ultimately what I'm suggesting is that I need to find terms and language that horizontally rather than hierarchically explain my choices as pluriversal. So acknowledging that there are many legitimate ways of knowing the world in and of themselves rather than universal i.e. there's only one way of knowing the truths of this world. So I'm just passing over to Chris now, and then I will come back later. Yeah, and just to continue that point, I think this quote from Jeff Farrell is, is brilliant. It says, if we can dismantle the mythologies of dominant methods, destroy their intellectual arrogance and assumed acceptability, and confront the institutional practices that promote and protect them, we can perhaps uh, hope to keep our scholarship open to progressive possibility. And for me, participatory research approaches are a means in which to destroy the intellectual arrogance of positivistic research methods, ensure that there's another way of doing things, of generating knowledge um, from the bottom up, not the top down. And the key word in this quote for me is, is hope. As I think back to like the previous two webinars that we've done on the work of all the amazing community researchers, I think what really underscores them all is this notion that adopting participatory approaches to research is really about undertaking a methodology of hope. This might be hope in fostering change, or it might be hope in keeping our approaches um, to research open to progressive possibility through the dismantling and redistribution of, of power in research dynamics. Um, and what I like about the word hope is that it's, it's an ongoing thing. No one will ever do perfect utopian research, whether that's ethics, methods, analysis, representation or outcomes. Hope just means that we do, we, we always try to do things better and think reflexively and never, never, never settle in that pessimism associated with kind of procedural exploitative research. And on that note, my approach to my PhD research was really influenced by two key books, which I recommend everyone reading, and you can find the references for them in the delegate pack that was sent around. Um, firstly, Linda Tui's, uh, Linda Tui Smith's seminal text on decolonialising research methodologies really gets into the heart of the theory of why we need to do bottom-up research as a way of countering and avoiding the epistemic violence of research conducted through imperial eyes. And then secondly, this book from 2018 by Shamsa Sinha, uh, Les Bach, 
and their co-researchers, Charlene Bryan, Vlad Barakut and Murdo Shembe, is not just fantastic because of its theoretical contribution um, to the sociology of migration, but the methods that they use to explore the everyday with and alongside their participants um, really encourage me to embrace the messiness and uncomfortable nature of doing participatory research. Both of these books provided me with that hope for doing, for doing the research that I did. They provided me with the theoretical and some of the practical tools for exploring the insignificance of participating in informal football sessions in the lives of my friends who were, who were navigating the UK's brutal asylum process. And, uh, and here are my friends. Uh, so this photo is taken from uh, an initiative called Football for All, which me and a bunch of pals started in 2013. Um, I don't have time to go into the story of it, um, but there's a, there's a chat, I wrote a chapter about it in my PhD, how, how this thing started and, and spiraled to what it is today. So my research was about, about this space, but also the significance of this space. Um, how did the meaning of, of it spill out into the everyday lives of the people who attended Football for All sessions? And also, what are the insignificances too? I think too often when we do, when we do leisure research, we want, to say, we want to say X leads to Y. But sometimes it's equally as important to acknowledge like, the irrelevance of something especially in relation to power, or not necessarily the irre irrelevance, but the, the insignificance of something in relation to power. Um, and yeah, I showed this photo to Artie uh, a couple of days ago and she, uh, she wet herself at the, at the thought of me playing football. <laughs> so um, quickly to an extremely brief overview of my PhD project, I'm not gonna go into it too much, um, in terms of like the ins and outs of it. But I, uh, I started off, well, I got to this question, what is the insignificance of participating in football, in, in informal football spaces in the everyday lives of forced migrant men? Um, funnily enough, that's not the question that I started out with. The original question that I started with is the impact of playing football on asylum seekers in Leeds. And once I'd read that decolonial literature that I talked about, I changed the question um, and I changed the question to be more open and exploratory and less kind of prescriptive. I wanted to find out the significance and insignificance in the everyday. From there, I, uh, I worked with nine men who I knew from the Football for All sessions prior to the research. And um, basically I said to, I, we always have like chats and stuff after football, uh, any announcements or that sort of thing. I said, I'm doing this research. If anyone's interested, come speak to me and we'll have a chat about it. And, um, and yeah, from that, nine, nine men were kind of interested and, and, and wanted to stick, stick with it. Um, so I asked them, what does football for all mean to you in the context of your life in Leeds? And it, I asked that question, deliberately broad as a way of them being able to, to, to take ownership of the direction of the research. And I explained to them that they could explore that in any way that they wanted to. Um, so I said, basically, like the research methods could be whatever they wanted it to be, whatever made sense to them as a way of exploring what they felt was important. And that was, and I suppose that originally came from the fact that these, these were my friends. Um, so it was about trying to find research methods that collectively spoke to, to our friendships as, as, we, as we saw them. Like, I don't know if anyone's ever done like kind of um, semi-structured interview with friends before, but it's always a bit weird, isn't it? Like, it's always a bit weird doing, being like, oh yeah, we know each other, but you sit down there and I'll interview you. Like, if I'd done that, I probably would have just got some funny looks. So it was about, you know, my, um, my desire to, to create a collaborative research process actually came from wanting the research to speak to and develop um, the existing friendships. So we ended up doing basically like bespoke research methods for, for each person and also like if there was friendships already between them, we developed research methods that spoke, spoke to that as well. 
and that. So they ended up ranging up from hanging out in the park um, at participant homes, going to like chicken shops, just sitting in chicken shops for the afternoon, eating chicken and talking about whatever whatever we wanted to talk about. Um, on the bus and also with uh, during the research process, I said to one of the participants, let's go for a coffee and you know, thinking like, oh, we'll go Costa or Starbucks or something. And they took me to this place in Leeds called, uh, well, they call it Chaikana. And it's basically a, a tea house that sits underground for a really kind of nondescript door that I would never know about had, that I, had I not kind of allowed the participants to choose the research methods. So yeah, there was walking interviews, uh, photography, like, and also playing football as well. That was part of the research research methods as well, playing football together. Um, and I can already hear like people's brains going over, yeah, but what happens? What where, where is the analysis? Where's the analysis fit into this? And and the truth is, this is something that that deeply troubled me when I kind of was at the early stages here planning what the research was going to look like when the whole point of the research was that I didn't know what it was going to look like. Um, so yeah, where does analysis sit? And I'll talk about that. Um, to understand what analysis is though, and looks like, we need to understand knowledge generation and flows in research settings. Um, so here, what I've attempted to do is diagrammatically map out flows and knowledge uh, in relation to different types of research. And this is super simplified. I haven't allowed space for like nuance or complex power dynamics like race, gender, etc. Nor have I recognized the significance of supervisors as gatekeepers who are also relevant to the flows of knowledge. But I hope that by simplifying it this much, an understanding of what we're trying to do when it comes to participatory research can be a bit clearer at an epistemological level. Not only that, I think this diagram really drives home how and why it is important to think critically about the analysis process when we're doing participatory research. So if we look at that top line, I've mapped out what flows of knowledge look like in what you might describe as a Western traditional positivistic approach to research. And that's both quantitative and qualitative, but perhaps more crystallized in, in quantitative research. So the researcher is in is the orange figure and the participant is the purple figure. And in the crudest possible terms, what happens is the researcher extracts the information that they are looking for from the participant based on a research question that was cooked up far away from the community and then regurgitates it through their own eyes, um, through their own eyes into research outputs. And when you think about research with communities, in particular indigenous communities, we can see how this is a process of extraction and analyzing through the eyes of the researcher. Given the imperial connotations of resource extraction, I, I always find it helpful to draw upon the metaphor of mining to explain what Linda Tui Smith refers to as research as a research method and analysis through, through imperial eyes. The process of mining involves the extraction of pre-established natural resources such as oil, gas, coal, etc. In this scenario, the miner knows what materials they're going to extract. They have the tools to extract the resource and the extraction of the resource exclusively serves the interests of the company carrying out the mining. Likewise, when research is carried out through imperial eyes, the researcher has already established what is to be researched. They come equipped with the ready-made tools to extract that information that they see with the research findings primarily serving the personal interests of the researcher and the interests of their affiliated institution. And as Smith says, this type of research is, is, is imbued with an attitude and a spirit which assumes a certain ownership of the entire world and which has established systems and forms of governments which imbued that attitude in institutional practices. These practices determine what counts as legitimate research and who count as legitimate researchers. And like Adam says, this is a research method of extraction of, of extraction that translates context, content rich, context particular meaning 
into context-free, context-general information. And by doing so, it loses, it loses meaning and it fails to represent the life world of the participants in all its vibrant complexity. So the second line, and like what I think uh, what's great about PAR is that it provides us with the tools to start thinking about doing research differently to these kind of entrenched, entrenched research methods. However, because these methods are so entrenched, because we're so tethered to the cave that I was talking about, I feel like we can sometimes be susceptible to reproducing them and sometimes going through the motions of PAR method without thinking critically about what we're doing can result in doing research through, through imperial eyes. So again, this second line shows that whilst PAR methods might, might be being performed, sometimes there still is the same level of knowledge extraction where the research mines knowledge from communities and then takes it away to analyze and reproduce research outputs that do not serve the interests of the participants. So you can see here, the orange figure sits amongst the purple figure. It's there, knowledge, knowledge might, be, might be spiraling, but there's still this process of, of extraction where the researcher ends up sitting far away from, from, from temporally and spatially far away from, from the meaning making process. Now, the third line represents what I think knowledge flows look like and felt like when I was doing my research. Um, and again, like this is what I've just come up with in preparation for this research. So, you know, I haven't asked the participants, they might have felt differently about this. And again, to be clear, I'm, I'm not claiming to have written to like have reached some sort of utopian position, but I was thinking critically about knowledge generation and co-creation all the way through the process. And that just helped me do a few things differently. And uh, one of them things that really shaped this approach was that I was, again, I was conducting research with friends. So the kind of methods that you'd associate with the top line would have been inappropriate anyway. Um, and friendships tend to be horizontal relationships. Obviously, they're not always, and, and there's, you know, like there, there's, there's tensions within them, um, but they at least tend to be more horizontal than like research participant relationships. So again, the context of our friendships meant that we're already sitting alongside each other rather than far apart in the other two scenarios. So my experience was that I found myself wandering and wondering alongside my friends, relinquish, relinquishing power to my friends to decide what is to be researched and how, how to research meant that I was alongside them as we explored their life worlds. Meaning making was happening live in the process of doing research. I wasn't extracting information and running away with it. I was there in the space with the participants talking and sharing experiences and trying to make sense of them individually and collectively. And this resulted in knowledge being generated and represented in different ways, whether it was in the academic spaces of uh, book chapters or conferences, or through developing our individual and collective friendships and other things like exam revision. We worked exam revision in, as a method, like they, they had ESOL exams and we worked that in as a method of how we do things. And in that process, you know, the method was contributing to both the PhD outcome and also what they needed and what, what they desired from, from, from the process as well. Um, but, you know, I still had to write a PhD and it was, it was my name on the front of the PhD, not my friends, not my core researchers. So there is still a really strong element of extraction, even in what I felt like knowledge looked like in, in my scenario. And I wrestled with this a lot and I, be, I beat myself up about it. I think I arrived at the position where I see participatory research as a process whereby we must, as researchers, always be sitting in discomfort and making those critically inf informed decisions. And if we're doing that, we can acknowledge the tensions and we can write about them and we can maintain that sense of hope that I talked about. So the material analysis of the materiality of everyday life, big or party for that title. Um, I couldn't have come up with that by myself. 
Um, so like I said, the analysis of research was something that I found really difficult to square when planning the research because I didn't know what the research material was going to look like. But what really helped me was changing how I saw research. I changed my perspective that research was about data, that kind of positivistic view, to one that was really about generating material analysis of the materiality, messiness, and vibrancy and complexity of everyday life in Leeds. Once, once uh, I saw research in that way, I started really thinking critically about what analysis is and what sort of analysis is coherent to my approach to research. And let's face it, like research analysis is often the unspoken part of social research. It's often a paragraph of a paper that says something about codes and something about en vivo and quickly skips over it. And I think when we think about analysis, we often envisage an analysis phase that is temporally and spatially separate to being in the field, like in scientific research where data is brought back to a sanitized lab for testing against known truths about the universe. And our job as participatory researchers is, is not to test research samples to establish truths about different life worlds, but to explore them in their context, rich complexity. Chris, shall I just um, add something about material? Yeah. So this is kind of what I mean by having to find language and terms which help us to kind of move away from the predominant Western social science canon. Because that word data, if you start looking underneath that word and where it come from and where what it means, it kind of makes you think about the positivistic um, discourses that you know continue to permeate through um, the social science methods and methodologies that we choose. And I, I really like the term material because it makes us think about not just data as one set of statistics or one this or one that. Material makes us think about the plural. So the different things that we might pull together to help us to understand the life worlds of different groups of people. And, you know, these are the materialities of their life. So the circumstances that shape their life choices, um, the social, social, cultural, economic, political um, circumstances that they have to live and navigate. And this material then enables us to kind of capture some of those nuances um, and complexities but also by getting your participants to be involved in the material, it's also a way to speak back to um, dominant narratives about who they are and what their experiences are like. But through the material, um, it gives the opportunity for your participants to represent and negotiate and challenge these bigger discourses um, and to be able to explain the materiality of what their life is all about. Yeah, and I think the point that I, I really want to hammer home here is that, is that meaning making happens in the field. Analysis is often interwoven into participatory methods such as photo voice and, and art-based participatory research methods. Um, Knowledge, knowledge is not out there waiting to be uncovered. It is generated through social research methods as we do them. Uh, as researchers interested in participatory methods and the significance of power dynamics in relation to knowledge, we need to constantly reaffirm a commitment to the generation of knowledge from the bottom up, not the top down, and avoid these kind of positivistic slippages where possible. Uh, for my research, one thing that I didn't anticipate, again, was like the role of friendships um, with, uh, with and across the participants in, in really making sense of their life worlds. Our friendships were basically doing, doing the hard work of analysing the materials that we produced. Often this was through conversations where we just talked through ideas as they were emerging. And I'd listen out for, for cues from from the participants, from my friends of, you should tell them about, they'd say stuff like, you should tell them about, tell the people this. And what they're actually saying is, I'm telling, I'm telling them this, I will tell them about this. And practically on writing days, I would often like exchange messages or 
voice notes, like WhatsApp voice notes with my friends saying, listen, like the PhD says I need to like, I need to sit down and write. I'm writing about this based on what we were talking about here. Have I got this right? And they would like expand or, or, or correct me or, or, or bring in something else completely. Um, so yeah, the analysis process is, is happening temporally and spatially. Like it's not, it's not separate, it's alive and it, it's there in, in that moment. So representing complex life worlds. Um, I think, you know, when you think about your own personal friendships, one of the main ways you know and understand each other is often through the unspoken, you know, the silences, the emotion, the pleasures and the tensions of your friendships. And you realize these social connections are a way of knowing. And I think we need to really recognize that in, in analysis as well. Like, you know, the, the way you connect and the way that you feel is, is, is how knowledge is, is how knowledge is being transferred. It's not always, it's not always the recordable. And when I say that, I mean like audio recordable. And I think there's still a space for thick description, like in street corner society, using those kind of traditional techniques for different purposes, for capturing and representing some of that. Um, and like one thing that I'm really interested in, like new or renewed ways of representing the materiality of different lives, uh, different of, of life. Um, can we represent the sensory through art and through videos and make it PhD? And that's the question that I'm, would love to know the answer to like how do we go about doing that and i wish that kind of you know it took me three years to get to work through like these thoughts in my head and if i had the time again that's something that i would do and i and i will do for future for future projects chris can i just add something to that yeah. by the way um so do you know when chris was doing his phd he had all this sort of material and it's almost like through the conversations he was having in the field, you know, stories and themes were kind of emerging. And so he was bringing that material together in different ways um, to kind of reiterate that story. And we always then reflected, you know, was there a different way he could have caught some of the sensory aspects of the emotional lives of it, the men who were playing football with him but then you know I think towards the end of your thesis you know we realized there is still of this value in thick description which um you know where language and words can be used to capture nuances and that words can be powerful and this is what I mean by then you know understanding research as a pluriversal project so the western social science canon is here and it has all these techniques and one of them is thick description for example and then you've got other ways of knowing and there's all different kind of ways that you know um, scholars doing indigenous or decolonial research might choose to um, collect the research and how they might represent it and actually you know straddling across this is why how we treat it horizontally and that we're not saying one is better than the other. Yeah. We're saying that it's okay to perhaps weave and think about these things together and create a dialogue between them. Um, but that does create discomfort because when we get judged, you still then end up having to perpetuate in some ways um, Western social science rationalities as part of that justification. So there's possibilities then in coming together, but there's also tensions. Go on, Chris. Um, so, I mean, like the way that I came to power was quite organically through, through really reckoning with a lot of that theoretical work and the stuff that I just talked about. Um, but there's, there's also like, quite clear techniques of how, how to weave that in, almost procedurally weave, weave that in and, and to make it method rather than the messiness of what, what my PhD ended up looking like. And there's a range of different techniques. I'm not gonna go super into them and the references are at the end, but like verification processes, idea of taking research back to participants, 
um, to challenge or prioritize the research themes that have emerged. Um, I always think with that the language can often be quite positivistic, so just be careful because often they talk about like validity and what do we mean by words like validity. Um, data parties, so like gathering of participants where the data is presented back, what they've come up with is presented back um, to allow critical reflection. I, I think what I'd say with this one is if you're calling something a data party to your participants, make sure that it lives up to its name of a party. Don't just focus on the data side of things. Um, Art-based think tanks, participants explore agreed research questions through a range of self-selected art methods that enable them. Participants then present art to the group and establish common themes and differences. Again, like you can see how this is spatially and temporally woven into the to the method itself. Uh, photo voice we'll talk about later. Open card sorting, this is often seen more kind of like market research stuff, but it has been woven into um, social research as well. So a process of sorting data and themes in response to the research question alongside participants individually or collectively. And that aids the creation of sub themes and visually understanding the overlap between the themes as well. Using advisory boards to bring the participating data back to the working group to make sense of it collectively. Again, this adds another layer of meaning making to the process. So that again is, 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 is data in itself, whatever the word data means. Um, and then listen launch parties, so space to listen back to like co-creating music podcasts and reflect on meaning i think for that like just reflect back onto onto um onto what people talked about last week um with podcasts and and, and with music so all that information you can find the references for all that stuff on the slides they'll be they'll be sent around um, so the practicalities of doing analysis when the research material is varied i don't know this is something that the the <laughs> that Robin's facing at the minute as well. So what I found incredibly anxiety inducing was that, you know, I was basically, I let everyone choose their own method and develop their own research method. But I, I ended up with a shit ton of different and varied material. I had transcripts from like walking tours of leads, photos, hangouts, voice clips, just a huge wad of stuff basically. And it was so anxiety inducing because it was the opposite of how I've done research before. So like coding transcripts where everything is the same, neat and tidy. And you test your transcripts against your variable, which is your code, and then build a theme and then write up from there. And plain and simple, that wasn't going to happen because each chunk of material was different by nature. But because meaning making was happening in the field alongside the participants, the method didn't actually matter because they were just vehicles for us to co-generate the themes that formed the thesis. So I had the themes sorted, they had emerged, and when I was writing it, it was more a case of going back through the materials and seeing how those themes had presented themselves and then ringing the participants, like exchanging texts and, and, and whatever, like just to kind of sound stuff out. And this was a process that absolutely had to be done to write a coherent PhD. And it's challenging because you're tasked with piecing together a coherent na uh, narrative through writing that represents these complex life worlds. And that's parts, uh, and, and there's parts of my PhD where I'm like, I can tell that I'm writing it in a really frustrated way because I'm limited and restricted by my words. Something that I wish, like I said, I had embraced was that sensory approach to research methods and thinking about different ways that we could have represented like embodied emotions in the final thesis. Um, but yeah, future project. And yeah, so just to end like representation, representational democracy, like a big thing for me was like, well, what the participants got out of this? Like I'm getting a PhD out of it. What, what do the participants get out of it? And it was about ask, actively asking the people I'm working with, what can this research do for you? So like my mate Khalid, uh, he he just done an MA at the University of Le Leeds and he, wanted, he was interested in academia. So I worked with him to see how my PhD research could support his academic aims. And we went to a leisure studies symposium organized by Nicola um, 
and we put a presentation together which ended up becoming a book chapter that we wrote uh, and obviously this is a super rare example and you know chances are your participants co-researchers won't have much interest in co-writing and co-presenting but that doesn't matter it is literally whatever the person wants to do and get out of the research um, and just ask yourself what can you do to facilitate that so these guys here samir and Haider, um you know they they at the time they were seeking asylum and leads and they were in um asylum accommodation and all they wanted to do was uh go out to the countryside and see the countryside because they didn't have that opportunity so i just used the money that leads back it had given me for the research to to take them to the countryside for the day and it wasn't necessarily about trying to you know I wasn't thinking oh, I need to get X, Y, and Z out of this. You know, that stuff just emerged. And even if I ended up writing a sentence in my PhD about, about what we did, then, then that was enough. Um, so yeah, just be honest about your intentions who, when you're doing par, who, who, who gets what, and can we, can we facilitate, you know, doing things differently. And the best example I've heard in ages was from, uh, it was either from Caitlin or Audrey the other week when they talked about recognizing contributions. Um, and that meant for like, they couldn't pay people. So it meant paying for that, uh, um, exams to be sat because they couldn't access public funding to, to sit exams. So just really kind of tangible stuff like that is, is important. And I, we're just running out of time. So just to be, a uh, just to finish, I think moving beyond, I think one of the ways that we can do this is by moving beyond a positive, positivistic approach to anonymity. And it's something that, you know, it was one of the things that, that stood out to me quite, quite early on after I'd read this decolonial literature was, um, you know, and sitting in discomfort, can we let the participants decide if they want to keep their names in the research and what name do they want to use? And I felt it was ethically quite dodgy to act. I thought I felt it was quite dodgy to say, like, I am doing this work with you. You're producing so much and I'm just going to cross your name out and put another name in there. And um, so it's about bringing those ethical questions back to the people that we're working with. And like it really it, like that process was actually ended up being really important because some of the guys kept their names in there, their real names in there. Some of the other guys, like, they wanted to change their names, but one of the guys changed, changed his name uh, in the research. And I asked him the reasoning behind the name that he chose, and he said, because that's the nickname my mum calls me back home. And I felt it was such a powerful thing to be like, he was like, I want, I want my mum to know that that's me, and that's my way of connecting with my mum. And I think Artie will talk about this as well, like color, the, the coloring of names. So Artie? Yeah, I'm gonna try and be quick if I can, but um, you know, talking to the discomfort of sometimes doing research with people who might be similar or different to us in different ways across age, generation, class, race, ethnicity, gender, sexualities, disabilities, um, you know, a whole plethora of, you know, connections that we might have and share, but also differences. And this is where sometimes naming is quite important because is it, whose name is it? Is it the one that you're giving them or is it one that they are deciding for themselves? And, you know, we can all go and do research like Chris was saying and extract and mine and then give these nice names to people. Um, but it just doesn't sit right. And I know people then often give their participants opportunities to select their own names um, or pseudonyms, And that's one way of kind of getting around this issue. But when I reflect back on my own research, which is predominantly with South Asian communities, and then I'm reading around the subject, I get a little bit irked and I can't, you know, it's just the sitting in discomfort. I feel a bit of irritation somehow. And it's because I find these all highly weird ethnic names stuck in there to color 
the exotic, if you like. And whilst these pseudonyms, whether they're picked or given, I don't know, it just is like, well, couldn't you find, I don't know, I could, a different name. It just does not sit well with me. And then I, in my own research, I decided not to give people names like, you know, first name, surname, because in my research about women's football, which was my PhD research, a lot of the players that I interviewed and hung out with, they wanted to be known as players. So, you know, people that were passionate about playing football and not just in terms of their racial and ethnic identity. So I made a choice then to kind of go with this term players. But then, you know, I, I do my own head in and this is where, you know, sitting in discomfort can be, can be really, you know, anxiety inducing because then in other work I have named people and I've asked my participants to pick their names and I think oh my god that's really inconsistent with what I've said previously and then I change my mind again <laughs> it's like this learning journey and it's like okay well where am I going to go with this name in politics now and then when I did my walking project you know um I when I asked my participants well how shall I refer to you in this project? They were like, well, just use my name. And I remember one of them asked me, well, why are you even asking me that? And I just said, well, because we're trying to protect your anonymity. And part of the research, if people can locate you in this current context, so it's just post Brexit, there was a rise in xenophobia, you know, go, go home vans going around, areas where my parents lived and they are British citizens who have lived there for 40 to 50 years having you know contributed to their local space and more broadly getting told to go home and they said to me you know what we don't fear the we don't fear the you know fascist racist because this is just part of our life and so what is the point of not knowing me to protect me this is our reality anyway. So they wanted to be named. And, you know, it was about their stories. And particularly, I found when I was interviewing the women, when we spoke, their stories, you know, I don't know, it, it just was really nice for their name to be on their life story in all the context that I would use the material going forward. And finally, I do you just want to have a quick, uh, quick word yeah, on this? Yeah, so just to kind of sum up, Chris and I started with this idea of sitting in discomfort as a place of knowledge generation. And hopefully, as we've both spoken, you know, um, colleagues have been thinking about perhaps their own feelings of anxiety about the research they want to do or have done. And that, you know, it can be anxiety inducing because you may want to take a career up in academia. And so you need to kind of pass um, the measures of what that might mean. And at the same time, you're trying to do something that might be reflective and, you know, you have a responsibility to your participants who might, in our case, were friends and family. Um, you know, and there's a lot of then pressures that come together and so taking a risk into the unknown, you know, oh my God, I, I don't know how I let Chris do what he did. <laughs> because I must have been on one at the time. But, um, do you know, I guess I did because we were reading the same stuff and coming from the same place. And I had felt this confidence in the research we were reading and talking about that traveling in this unknown direction for both of us, you know, was also a journey. And so through sitting in this kind of discomfort of saying, oh my God, am I going to be setting Chris up for the biggest fall? You know, and do I have faith that it's all going to be okay? But, you know, we did it. And actually, even though we were doing something that was based on decolonial indigenous and feminist methodologies. And so we had to speak back 
to the sort of dominant Western social sciences as part of what that involved. You know, I think for a lot of scholars, whatever approach you're coming from, you have to negotiate these tensions because that's what part of being a scholar and doing a PhD is about. And Kyle took this off the slide, but I call it the head fuckery because honestly, navigating your way through research sometimes can feel like such a head fuck. And you feel like, oh, why the hell did I do that? Oh God, how am I gonna justify this? What am I gonna do to fix that problem? But you know, it's the head fuckery is where knowledge comes from. And so sitting in tension and journeying into the unknown, you know, your head fuckery is going like that, but somewhere along the lines, you create the dots and connections and, you know, you are able then to move away from the head fuckery. And, you know, this is what I really love now about my job. I love that head fuckery. I love it. And it's like, I feel a bit tragic I even admit that, but it's the joy of like putting the pieces together, especially when you know the way you're putting the pieces is not only going to progress, you know, um, the disciplines that you might find yourself in and, you know, um, create your own career. It also may help you to say something which is just important to your participant as an end in itself. Um, and because I don't like to use language that's necessarily too academic, I like head fuckery because it's my word, it's my language, it's where I come from, it's how I understand life. And you know what, I'm not apologizing for using it. And Kyle, don't take my words off again. <laughs> it's because this is, this is the thing that we have to do. You don't, don't judge me for using words like that. These are the words that I'm using to make sense of my reality of head fuckery, which hopefully might then resonate with some of you guys and, you know, what we're all trying to do through our different PAR projects. Should we stop there? I think so. I think, I think you touched upon this stuff anyway. And yeah, it's a good ending point. We have got, is there any questions in the chat already? Um, and we'll do quick five minutes before we have a break. Um, I can't, I'm really sure Zoom. Um, so can anyone see the questions? Oh, here we go. Um, So, David, uh, how did you remember or recall these conversations and materials when it came to writing? Yeah, good point. Um, so we did do so like the walking interviews and stuff like that. It was just a case of um, we both wore a little lapel mic as we walked around. And like after about two minutes, we both forgot about it. And do you know what? One of the walking one of like one of the participants was like, I want to show you around Leeds. And it was incredible, basically. It was a completely different Leeds to my own, which is the point of doing of doing research like that. And I'm from Leeds. I've lived here, I've lived here all my life. And his Leeds was just so different to my Leeds. Um and yeah, like he we ended up doing like a 14 mile walk <laughs> in a day. Um and I got home afterwards and uh, and I was like, right, how am I gonna how am I gonna talk about this in the PhD? Because what I what I ended up doing, I had I had like a seven hour audio recording um, that was punctuated by photographs that he'd taken as we went along and that I'd taken as well. Um, so I ended up I ended up like using those photographs as as moments of punctuation, so I could go to I could go to the audio recording and type up that bit of transcript. And then, um, so like in some cases I could use, I could use people's own words in the writing. Other times it was, um, you know, when we're doing the hangouts, I, I kind of flipped. I did start by, by doing audio recording because I thought, you know, it's really important to capture people's own words and stuff like that. And again, it was, it was this really kind of, it was that sitting in discomfort of um 
I thought, you know, it's so much better to capture people's own words, but also, you know, I was also writing about those silences and those mo and those pleasures and those joys that I was talking about earlier. And actually the audio recording was missing so much. And that's one when, when Artie was saying, like, if we're doing like pluriversal research, then 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 like there is still space for those those thick descriptions and and par par is not about removing yourself as a researcher from the process. Like there is still spit like we we're, we're there generating knowledge alongside people as well. There's still there's still space for me to to write what I was feeling in this moment when I'm with that person. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a combination of different things. There was like material stuff um, generated and quite a lot of material stuff generated as well. Um, did you find the university institute? ethics process reinforced conventional uh yes yeah i did i had to so i sent off a i sent off a ethics application and uh it didn't get rejected i just had to go to a meeting in i was in the school of sport as well bearing in mind like that's, that's quite an important bit of information here um i had to go to a meeting with people from the ethics board and not all of them were even from social science background. So I really had to justify what I was doing. And I somehow I managed to do that. But yeah, there is there is quite a lot of kickback. And what I did rather than say, I'm gonna completely let the participants decide the research methods, I said, we'll be doing a range of research methods. These are some of the examples. And I talked about the examples and that was my way of passing through it. Um, so yeah i think um, also you know um i would have gone ballistic if they didn't pass chris's ethics and i was ready to like march up to the uh ethics committee <laughs> and let loose but then luckily you know we have a colleague john who sits on the um, ethics panel and he uh kind of was able to talk to the politics of what chris was doing and why it was important and he could therefore speak the language that the ethics committee kind of wanted to hear. But I know when I did my own research, for example, you know, I was doing it with friends and family and my dad was the research assistant. I had to justify that. And how I did it was I went to the literature and I found literature that would make sense and would be persuasive. I created an argument essentially and again you know I've got John who was the ethics person and we had conversations and through those conversations you know he was able to see the sort of direction of travel that I wanted to go in and he supported that now I appreciate that in some institutions it's not like that however however getting the ethical clearance to do the research when I then went to publish it the amount of questions I got about methodology and method and it really did start pissing me off because I just wanted to write about the methodology and method as it related to the literature I was reading and the arguments that I was formulating of why it was important but I kept having to come back to you know the positivistic um, you know questions around reliability generalizability blah, 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 whatever and it's like it got a bit painful for me in the end but to kind of get it published I just did it and you know it's part of reflecting on that choice now that is making me think you know I need to find another way to make this argument without kind of reinforcing the canon that I'm trying to disrupt and you know even in a journal um, like sociology where one of my papers was published one of the reviews was really bad and it said how did this get ethical clearance i ain't reviewing this bin it and like you know you have to kind of take it on the chin and i was like but i got ethical clearance and you know the ethics of it was totally uh, trashed and therefore the whole project and knowledge that i was speaking about was trashed 
So you know what? I was quite lucky because the other one, other reviews were quite good. And um, I just, you just have to take that on the chin. But this is, that, that's why we need to kind of push our, push the institutional and, you know, um, spaces that we're in to make room for publishing in ways that are not necessarily viewed as traditional or acceptable, but are pushing the boundaries of how we represent our academic knowledge. And on that note, <laughs> I think if we have a five minute break, um, so if we come back at 20 past three and we'll attempt to do some participatory analysis with some fake data. Um, so yeah, 20 past three and then we'll crack on. Um, see you in a bit. Is then possible to think about how we can use this information to enact meaningful social change. The big study introduced the research to the group, the broad theme, e.g., what like what we're going to do today, leisure in lockdown, and you talk about photo voice as a method. You provide people with cameras and the training to use the cameras and the ethics of, of using cameras and what you can't take photos of. Um, you ask the people, you ask the participants to take two photos, or it can be more than that, that speak to the theme or a collaboratively established research question. Um, so they take those two photos and they write or record a short description of their own photographs. Um, they bring that to the group and share their photos and tiles with their peers, perhaps expanding on their short descriptions again. Um, and then the group then analyze the photographs as a, as a whole through a series of exploratory questions, which, I'll, which are, are in the slides next. Based on the collaborative answers to the questions, the group then label and group the photos with themes or take a new picture to represent the theme as a whole. Um, and then at the end, there's often like a, a, a chance to exhibit photos in the frames um, through posters back to back to policymakers. Sorry, that's super rushed, but, but I think quite a few people have some kind of idea about photo voice, and all these on all the instructions will be on the um, will be on the document as well. So your task is to basically role play doing photo voice. Um, it's, I think we're doing till, yeah, it be half an hour. So in your breakout rooms, you'll be allocated a breakout room by Amy. Um, open the Google document where you'll find a series of photos and descriptions that represent experiences of leisure slash life in lockdown. Please imagine that these photos that you have are all taken by people within the group. Like that's a really important part of it. We wanted that to be the case. But for ethical reasons, we couldn't we couldn't do that. Um, so yeah, you're just gonna have to role play as if these are these are photos that you own. As a group, go through the photos and make notes on the document as you go. Think about what do you see here? What is really happening here? How does this relate to our lives? And what can we learn about it or learn from it? Um, and shout out to Loy from last week because they're. Um, their slides informed that bit of the bit of the task. Um, after that, as a group, relabel the photographs with any themes that emerge. Are there any crossovers between the themes that you have labeled? And equally as important, what are the differences and contradictions? This process is not about homogenizing people's experiences. Like, look for those contradictions and differences as well. Um, and finally, prepare notes to bring back to the main room, nominate one person to speak if you want or speak or, or a couple of people to speak. We can, all, we can also use this time to reflect on the process of doing photo voice. So when we come back into the main room, it might not be a case that you want to talk about, you know, what themes emerged, but we can also talk about photo voice as a method as well. Um, and also, we also wanted to make sure that you have time to use the breakout room to discuss your thoughts and concerns of participatory analysis, um, you know, relating it to what you're doing and your ideas. Um, what are the benefits? What do you think the challenges are? 
is it truly participatory and where are those where are those moments of discomfort um but yeah only if you have time um and i suppose in true participatory process like feel free to use the rooms as you feel um but this is a this is a guidance um robin do you want to add anything to that no oh, i think that sounds awesome cheers chris yeah and you'll have access to that to the slide with the questions in the breakout room Fantastic. Yeah. So within the Google documents, within the Google folder, sorry, there are two, um, two documents. One of them has all the data in it. Um, and then the other one um, has the task sheet. Um, Ames, before we go into the breakout rooms, would you just be able to post the link with the three folders again, if that's OK? Lovely. Fantastic. OK, so we will pop you into the breakout rooms now. So please click on the Google folder that corresponds with the breakout room you're in. And if you have any questions at all, something's gone wrong, come on back to the main room and we will sort it out for you. Right. Cheers, everybody. Fantastic.